you're right in the heart of SEC country. You've obviously followed SEC football your entire life. Last year was an unprecedented year, unlike anything we'd ever seen. And I thought the interesting narrative all year last year, going in all preseason, going into the season, we're all wondering what the landscape of the season was going to look like. But I feel like we all felt optimistic. We're going to have a season some way, somehow it's going to happen. But I bring this up because this affected South Carolina directly. But the narrative last year was, oh, this season's going to be a mulligan. You know, no coaches yeah. are going to get fired. You know, hey, you know, I remember sitting there June, July, people saying, well, you know, if you go two and eight, what, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. It's a mulligan type season. And I knew when that conversation was happening, I was like, you know, it's really easy to sit here in June and July, even August, and say, ah, go two and eight, mulligan, whatever, we'll bring him back next year. Not only was Will Muschamp fired. I mean, we saw, what, three or four different coaching changes. Yeah. Derek Mason was the one I was really surprised about. Auburn's got a new head football coach. Um, you know, you just go down the list. Just talk about that. Were you yeah. – did you bite that hook of that narrative <laughs> that, you, that you thought everybody was safe? And were you surprised at just the amount of changes? I mean, these schools, you're thinking to yourself, okay, COVID, the economic ramifications, the, the money, the financial hit they're taking – these schools had no problem, or at least the boosters had no problem mm -hmm. spending the money to get these coaches out of here. Did that surprise you at all? And then specifically on the South Carolina side of things, were you surprised to see the Gamecocks make yeah. the change and, and, and get rid of Will Muschamp? Well, you know, it's a, it's a great question. And, and you know, before I – talking about, you know, saying we're going to have a season, I do got to give a shout-out to Greg Sankey. I, I thought the way he handled himself <laughs> yeah. uh, with the onslaught of pressure and, and momentum and kind of political forces going against him to stay patient and do the right thing, uh, he ended up showing the best leadership, and I do want to give a shout-out to him. Uh, but I didn't. You know, I, I was kind of in the minority. I go on the radio a bunch, and, and that was a hot topic, uh, you know, really going on. You remember about a month uh, – all the way through all the airwaves, radio and whatever. And, and it just was hard for me to see with as much money, even with the pandemic year, even without the, the full capacity and got people buying stuff from the concession stand and, and uh, getting jerseys and stuff like that. There's still so much pressure. And I actually thought, you know, uh, almost on the contrary, it could almost be like a reset where it, as an, as an uh, athletic administration, if you had a coach that was kind of in limbo or hanging on the balance or had to have a good year, Knowing that this could be a bad year almost gives you more ability to let the guy go or almost yeah. more momentum to thinking that. And I wonder how much behind closed doors that actually got talked about. But I didn't bite into it because we know how passionate – because boosters are fans. Right. That's what people have to remember. Boosters aren't like the, the Supreme Court where, you know, they have to be unbiased and follow the letter right. of the law and, and that stuff. They're down just whatever, fans whatever. with money. <laughs> they are fans with money and influence. Right. That's what they are. Yeah. And fans – For better or for worse, I'm For better that. or for yeah. worse. For better yeah. or for worse. Uh, so, so I didn't buy into that. Uh, and again, you know what's crazy, and, and I'll kind of flip, flip it on its head a little bit, Chris. Uh, with all the turnover we had last year, this is the first year, and I guess maybe you could say Ed Orgeron if he has, has another bad year, but I think that's a stretch. There's really no head coach on the hot seat in the SEC right. this year, which is something I really haven't ever seen before. So it's so interesting how you can go from pre-pandemic, nobody's going to get fired because it's going to be a mulligan. Yeah, they're getting axed left and right to now going into this year. Nobody's probably getting fired after this year unless there's just an unmitigated disaster, NCAA, you know, sanctions, or right. we find out something crazy. Uh, so, no, man, it's just funny how it works, but, uh, but I didn't bite into that narrative. With Will Muschamp, I'm curious to hear your thoughts yeah, on that situation. Yeah. You know, well, what, what did you feel like he had to do going into the 2020 season? And I guess, again, were you surprised that Sal kind of pulled the trigger? Especially, I mean, it basically happened – mid-season after the sixth game yeah. or so sixth or seventh game but after that stretch where you gave up 159 points over a three-game stretch it, it was just obvious I think and like you said the boosters and the influence they had seen enough in year five yeah. were you surprised the Gamecocks made that move you know I wasn't shocked I, I do got to say this kind of a little side note uh Will Muschamp was actually my dad's GA when he coached at Auburn uh wow. so I've known Will for a long time <clears throat> Uh, when he was at Auburn, we used to go eat at Buffalo Wild Wings with him all the time, and, and that was an interesting conversation. But, you know, I, I wasn't shocked. Uh, and, and just, you know, because you look at trajectory. And when you're South Carolina and you're sharing a state with Clemson and as much success as they're having and, and being the state school, uh, Will Muschiff just hadn't done enough. And I almost use the comparison to Gus Malzahn a little bit, Chris, because, you know, Gus Malzahn got fired at Auburn because the offense wasn't performing. That's why. And he's an offensive guru, an yeah. offensive guy. So it's you're having to bring in offensive coordinators to try and fix your offense when you're this offensive guru. That's a bad look and starts yeah. pushing you out of the door. And you look at Will Muschamp defensively. 
you're supposed to be this defensive guru and big time recruiter and and you with the talent not like they didn't have talent on defense last year at South Carolina look at the NFL draft look at some of the guys they got in this in the the junior class from last year uh but they weren't getting it done on defense and how can you sit there and go into a room saying I'm the guy that's going to lead us to the promised land when you can't even get the side of the ball that you're supposed to be uh, an expert on to perform. So uh, I think if the defense was playing lights out and the offense struggled because Colin Hill was limited and you lost Marshawn Lloyd before the season and you didn't have a ton of dynamic receivers outside of Shai Smith, maybe he hangs on. But when the defense started to go, I don't think there was any way they could keep him or really justify it, especially when you look at the talent and personnel they had on that side of the ball.